Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Yeah, say welcome to Flippo because he's not here. He will be. I just saw him in the hallway. Um, welcome to the 39th Caller Lab Convention. This session is titled A Visit with the Legends. Yeah, this session is also being recorded. And if we have questions later after we get done interviewing these gentlemen, why we'll have a microphone for all of you to use. I will have to tell you that history is a passion for me, and I like all kinds of it, Revolutionary War, Civil War, Oregon Trails, Santa Fe Trail, World War II, you name it, I like it. But I especially enjoy music history and our square dance history. And it has been long been one of my thoughts that we needed to have some way to record uh, something about the people who have created the activity that we now enjoy. And as it's evolved, it's kind of become this visit with the legends that Caller Lab has done over the last few years. And I'm very, part to be, very proud to be here. Um, a visit with these guys is that they started in the activity when the activity really started to become what we know today. And uh, today we're going to have four of these guys we're going to visit with. Uh, this first gentleman is from Albuquerque, New Mexico. He is Bob Brundage. And the second gentleman's from Cincinnati, Ohio, Jerry Helt. The third gentleman is from Alito, Texas, which is surrounded by Fort Worth. That's Melton Luttrell. And the guy that isn't here you can't see is from Tucson, Arizona, formerly of Abilene, Texas, is Marshall Flippo. He is wandering around the hall, is exactly right. Uh, this is not unusual. Not unusual. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, he has entered the room, Marshall Flippo. I'll tell you, you're supposed to sit there. I'll tell you a very brief story about him. A few years ago, I was driving in Iowa, got a phone call from Ken Bauer. And he said, Jerry, you got a map? I said, what? He said, you have a map. I said, well, yeah, I got a map. He said, pull over, we're lost. I said, who's we? He said, me and Flippo. I said, where are, are, where are you? And he said, we're in Missouri. I said, you can't be lost. Flippo lived there 41 years. I know you're not lost. He said, no. He said, we got directions from a convenience store. We don't know where we are. So I pulled over. Now, I'm 500 miles away, and I'm thinking my leg is being pulled. And uh, got my map out, and I said, what town are you beside? Flippo says, got no earthly idea. I said, I have to have more direction than that. He said, well, here comes a town. Here comes a town. He said, Osawatomie. I said, you are lost. You're in Kansas. You're not in Missouri. <laughs> True story. I'm not kidding. <laughs> he did not anyway it's it's a privilege to have these guys at our convention and for those of you that haven't called very long to listen to their stories because it's really cool we're going to start with Bob Brundish he's sitting right next to me uh, he started calling a very long time ago and uh, got into the activity with his parents. Uh, he got into the activity with his brother, Al Brundage. And Bob even brought along a picture. Part of what I wanted Bob here for was that he and Al started calling in a chicken coop. I'm not kidding. Started calling in a chicken coop. We have a picture right here in front of me. The gentleman on the other end of this the podium here that is lost also started calling in a chicken coop. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> anyway, I want to introduce you to Al Brundage. Give him a great big hand. We're so glad he's here. Bob Brundage, excuse me. Bob, if you would, I'd like to know a little bit of your history. There's a picture here, and we'll let some of you, we'll pass that around. This is a picture of a band. Everything was live music at that time. And, Bob, go ahead and tell them about this, if you would, please. 
Okay, well, this uh, this concept of uh, three of us starting to call in a chicken coop, and this is a, a picture in the chicken coop, actually. Uh, the uh, men in the community where I lived, called King Street, outside of Danbury, Connecticut, uh, got, got together, and uh, uh, there was a, an abandoned farm, almost abandoned farm that had a chicken coop, and the owner of it said, well, if you want to turn it into a 4-H club clubhouse, well, go ahead. So the men in the community got together. They put down a new floor. They took a fire gun and and uh, got rid of all the lice and so forth and the walls and the ceiling. They put a ceiling in the building and they refinished the walls and painted it up. And you can see there's a... Uh, an emblem of the Forage Club, and that's where Al and I started. The year is 1933. Right. This picture was taken in 1933 and was published in the Fairfield County uh, Forage Club or Extension Service Journal uh, in 1934. And uh, you'll find myself sitting at the far left and... Uh, our mother playing the piano and Al with a trumpet up in front. You can't even see his face because of the trumpet. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, <clears throat> and that's where we actually got started. Uh, the fellow on uh, banjo next to the piano uh, did most of the calling until he finished school and got his accounting degree and moved out of town. And that's when Al and I started shortly after this picture was taken. Uh, Al started calling first. And, uh, you know, little brother couldn't ever stand to have have big brother (coughs) outdo him, so he had to start calling as well. Uh, And so that was around 30, 1934, 35 that I actually started. And this is the... We used to have a... Uh, dances occasionally. A lot of it depended on the weather uh, because there was no driveway. There was all, this chicken coop was actually in an apple orchard, and uh, we usually got one square. And if most of the people showed up, uh, we would, might wind up with two squares. And here, amazingly, 75 years later, we have groups all over the country that are struggling to get two squares, right? <laughs> I hate to, th- hate to think about that, but, and, uh, that's where we started. And, uh, go ahead. Well, well, from then you progressed on, you, you did more calling, uh, and in the New England area, you started developing clubs. Uh, right. Was this after the war, before the war? Well, uh, my experience was that I attended the Lloyd Shaw uh, Summer School in 1954, and that was uh, the, that was the beginning. It was just about that time that uh, modern Westerns calling was starting to a, a, appear in New England. Uh, uh, I always thought that the activity in the wing that got started when Herb Gregerson came and put on a workshop in Brockton, Massachusetts. Uh, and I've been dying to find out when that was, but I, I, I can't seem to locate exactly when that was. But he was the one, he was the one that, uh, Introduced Do Paso. Uh, and I'd like, I'd love to expound on that a little bit sometime. But I have been told that Herb came in 1952 to 52. do that workshop. It was just about exactly when I expected, yeah. And uh, some of us uh, began to learn that Herb had been away from he he lived in Rio Doso, New Mexico, and he. Uh, was on a workshop tour, and he, in a one-month period that he was on this tour, 
he had a dance every night somewhere along the line, and he was charging a hundred dollars a night. And all of a sudden, those of us who were struggling to make ten or fifteen dollars a night suddenly perked up and said, "Whoa!" <laughs> And uh, that's when we first started the idea of square dance clubs. Uh, at that time, I was, living, I was living in Massachusetts, working at the University of Massachusetts. And uh, uh, that was the first square dance club that I formed. Uh, it was uh, outside of Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, and shortly thereafter, we expanded in western Massachusetts uh, had a huge activity we had a a monthly newsletter that came out that was two pages long single spaced on both sides and today there's it's it's down to a half page but uh, you also recorded were some of the first guys to record you and Al yeah. Because before that time, before what year did you use mostly live music? Well, oh yes, we used uh, always had live music uh, up until Modern Western came along. And uh, we had a struggle actually with amplification equipment when when this type of program started. Uh, uh, my original uh, set of equipment was called a Green Flyer. And it had a, it had a, uh, the first one that I bought was, had no case. Had, I had to build a case to, to hold it. And uh, uh, it was a struggle to try to find equipment that had a very variable speed possibility. The, uh, uh, I think the Green Flyer had the ability to vary uh, 10 degrees one way or the other, and that was it. Uh, because many of the square dance records that were available at that time were money that had done in Texas. Uh, Herb Gregerson was one, and uh, uh, I forget the name of some of the others, but they were quite, they were 150 beats a minute. <laughs> You could, you could slow him down as far as far as you could, and you're still going 140. <laughs> so, but uh, so. All right, and then Bob has the distinction. He had the idea to interview some of these legends. How many legends over the last few years have you interviewed, Bob? Well, I started the uh, this oral history project. In 1996, I, uh, I went to the National Square Dance Convention in uh, El Paso, and that's where I hooked up with uh, the, the first interviews that I did. And since then, uh, I've accumulated about, uh, about 140. I kind of lost track. I think we have 110 of them at, on the Square Dance Foundation of New England's website. And uh, there's some others that are owned by the Lloyd Shaw Foundation. And uh, those have been un unable to get on to our New England Foundation's website. But uh, uh, during the course of that time, uh, from then up until t shortly, not too long ago, when I made the last interview, uh, I was living in Albuquerque, and I I went to the West Coast about three times. I went to the East Coast uh, at least twice. I went down into f the Florida area, and and these entirely at my own expense, uh, and I'm sure I travel at least uh, 25,000 miles to uh, get to 
interview with these people in a variety of times at, at a national convention or in their own home. Uh, I was so happy to visit with people like Cal Golden and sit in his basement and look at the pictures that he had uh, on his wall in his recreation room and so forth. Uh, uh, one of Milton Rutro was one of my earlier interviewees, and uh, I got him at one of the nationals. And uh, so the count actually is 110 uh, that are available on the New England uh, Foundation's website uh, at the moment. What do you think? Bob Brundage. Well, uh, these interviews are very interesting. We're going to move on because we want to get all four of these gentlemen in. But uh, the dedication that Bob displayed to get these interviews, to get this, this oral history put down, is pretty significant. And this picture, uh, may I just pass this around, Bob? Would that be all right? for those of you to see it. And this is 1933. Understand that square dancing had almost died out. In the 20s, Henry Ford uh, started to put square dancing back on the map. He actually got it on the radio in Detroit. And then Lloyd Pappy Shaw, whom Bob went to their caller school at Cheyenne Mountain. That's where the revivals started and where this the, the spreading of square dancing came about. Our next caller is an old friend. Thank you. It is. He's an old friend. Many, many, many years ago at a Caller Lab convention, he's from Cincinnati, Ohio, and has been calling full-time since 1953. And if you would, give a nice hand to Jerry Helt. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think I'm probably really the youngest <laughs> up here. I started calling when I had diapers on, of course. I'm back to diapers again. <laughs> Full circle. Full circle, yes. <laughs> My wife says, you think he's kidding? <laughs> Anyway, I feel very near and dear. I'm looking at this picture, and it has a 4-H sign on it. And my first uh, experience with dancing was at a 4-H camp where they had girls on one side of the campus, boys on the other side. We were divided, and uh, the way they controlled this group was to take them out of the dance hall and just dance the pants off of us. And then everybody... <laughs> it's not literally, Marshall. <clears throat> and uh, everybody would go to bed, or supposed to go to bed, and by themselves, of course. And uh, so it, that was an experience for me. And I thought, this is really fun to do, and... To hear the guy call, he wasn't much of a caller, but it was very interesting that he could control people and move people around like contra lines, basically contra lines. Jerry, may I interrupt you to say what year was this and where? Uh, this would be, 50, so what, what would you say, Mama? 40th, 1943, the war years, yes. In fact, uh, the... I guess the Japanese war was ended at one of those weekends that we did, which was kind of interesting. Anyway, uh, 4-H is kind of near and dear to me. Uh, being a country boy living on a farm, we uh, belonged to a church, a very strong Protestant church that did not believe in dancing. So as time went on, I had a friend who drove a car, and we found out that the Catholics could dance. 
So we would go to the, the Saturday night dance with the Catholics and have a great time, you know. And these people were really, you know, swinging back in this other group, this church people. They're all sitting around praying with each other. And uh, so that was my early start in uh, traveling around, doing dances and so forth. A home program was really what I was after. Well, I went to school, went to engineering school, University of Cincinnati. And to sort of work my way through the school, I did one-nighters or dances around the Cincinnati area to raise little funds to live on and uh, finished my engineering. Uh, I practiced that for, what, one year and decided to do go into a dancing, square dancing. is a full-time thing, which was my family said, you're crazy. You've worked hard to get a degree, and you're going to be a square dance caller. What kind of an idiot are you? So I thought, well, it's a chance. I can always go back and be an engineer. Well, the truth is, never went back. Here I am, an idiot, you know, doing square dance calling. So uh, it's been very uh, enlightening. It's been really nice to deal with people. I enjoy being with people. And I think square dancing has probably saved a lot of people from many things, saved marriages, It's saved uh, people from having mental problems, all sorts of things. It's a mental health. uh, I'm on a crusade of mental health, of which we all need, don't we, (laughs) Filippo? Anyhow, to make a short uh, story, or make a long story short, it's a, a pleasure to be here. I'm honored. I'm a little embarrassed to be in front of a group of people talking about this because we don't usually discuss our personal life much. Particularly doctors. Yes. (laughs) And you should know. (laughs) I'll pass the mic on to this next gentleman. No, I've got a few questions for you. Yes. By the way, Jerry Helt's wife, Kathy, is sitting right here. If you would give her a nice hand. Um, Jerry has been a recording art, artist, as has Bob, as has all these gentlemen here. Uh, Blue Star, McGregor, Scope, Sets in Order, Hollywood, Kentucky, Gateway Records. He uh, has recorded with the Cincinnati Pops Orchestra. Uh, that's that's quite a thing. Yes, that's that quite is. quite an accomplishment. Uh, he's got video and audio cassettes. Uh he is a member of the American Square Dance Society Hall of Fame. Thank you. And I want you to tell a little bit about what I think is one of your phenomenal things you do at a dance, and that's your exploding squares. Well, I can't take credit for exploding squares and progressive squares. Don't have to squares. take credit for it. Just tell us about okay. it. Okay. Well, Ed Gilmore was the man that dreamed this up. Um he, he didn't really dream it up. There's a story about that, that he called a dance one night, and the people were in positions into the progressive square line position, and they were passing on to another square. They were doing it on their own. And poor Ed was calling, and the floor was staying together, and they were moving, but it was driving him crazy. What are they doing? They had this thing all set up. Every time they get lines, they'd pass through and pass through on to the next. So this was really the start of uh, progressive squares and exploding squares is, as you all know, squares exploding out into other squares. So Ed is the man that put that together, and all I did was ride in on his uh, experiences and uh, – They're really fun to do. I don't know how many do it, but you should do it. It's very good, lots of fun, very fulfilling. Also, Jerry has called full-time since 1953. You've called in all the states in in the United States and most provinces in Canada. But you are known for corporate parties. You do a lot of corporate parties that type of calling. Explain a little bit about that and, and 
how that's been good to you. Okay. Um, financially, corporations have a lot of moolah. And in many cases, um, corporations like to have some sort of a party or some – many times they want to know about um, – some dancing, American dancing. What do we do in America? Some of these corporations have people in from Japan. They have people in from all over Europe. And they like to show off what we do as a recreation. So square dancing is probably the recreation we're thinking of. And uh, many times we're hired for a company that has a reception or a group of people at meetings who want to relax and have a good time with square dancing. And that's where the one-nighter, or if you want to call it that, or new dancer program starts. And we do a lot of those. They are very lucrative. Corporations like it, and they want, they'll want they pay. There's no, no problem with the financial end of it. So we have geared a lot of our dances in that area, plus the schools. We're definitely interested in getting young kids from kindergarten all the way to college level dancing. And we do a program for kindergarten. We do a um, whole college campus program. And uh, it's I would recommend that anybody that's Square Dance Calling to look into that. It's, it's putting our Square Dancing out there where people really know what it is and know that we do have a traditional dance or a, a square dance that uh, we should promote. Well, one little thing we, uh, in recording with the Cincinnati Pops, we're looking at 100 musicians, union scale, and <clears throat> to get up in front of that group and call, it's kind of shaky. And just as we were ready to record with this, one of the stage hand, hands come up and said, uh, can you kind of step it up a little bit? We're running a little behind. We're looking at $1,000 a minute. At that point, I wet my pants. <laughs> but I have the diapers on. <laughs> anyway, it was uh, pretty scary, and we did it. And uh, it's my... I guess, fame to claim or claim to fame. I don't know what you'd call that. Thank you. It's it's very, very interesting. How many of you ever heard of a gentleman named Bob Ruff? From Bob Whitt Ruff. Whittier, California. Uh, I have never seen Jerry work with schools, but Bob Ruff came to our college when I was going to college, Wayne State College, and I went over there one day and watched the most wonderful exercise of working with college kids I've ever seen, and I assume that you do the very same thing. Uh, indeed, it's it's very, very, very interesting. Give a nice hand to Jerry and Kathy. Thank Hill. you. The next gentleman over here is from Alito, Texas, and it's, he just told me it's surrounded by Fort Worth. Alito's in the middle of it. Give a nice hand to Melton Luttrell. We're going to we're going to ask Melton when he started square dancing. Square dancing and calling. First square dance was in 1945. Just in the, the fall of 45, I had a girlfriend in college, it was my first year in college. God, I wish I still had her. <laughs> she was the one girl before my wife that I'd married, but she stood me up. And uh, I always look back at my failure to go square dancing because of it. I went one time, and I didn't like it with her, and she loved it. So, And she kept on and kept going, and we kept dating for a while, and she finally tossed me over for a guy that liked square dance. Uh, very little exaggeration on that. That's pretty well the way it was. And then uh, after I finally met the lady that became my wife, uh, I sort of got tricked into the square dancing thing. My mother and dad had started about a couple of years before me, and they also tried to get me to, and I said, no, I've been there and done that, and I don't like it. 
But uh, Sue and I were still in the dating stage, and uh, one night, and this is back when double dating was sort of popular when I was growing up. I don't know whether it still is or not, but uh, I think the mothers of the daughters felt safer if their daughter was double dating, so they encouraged that. So uh, Sue called me up one uh, day on the old-time telephones and said, uh, do you mind if we double date tonight? And I said, no, that would be fine. I said, okay. He said, we have a couple that's going to pick us up at such and such o'clock. And I said, a little earlier. They said, no. I said, we're going to go somewhere. Okay. Well, where we went was from one town to another town, which was about 35 miles away, about in West Texas at that time. And we went to uh, to Eastland, Texas, from Breckenridge, Texas. And on the way, I discovered we were riding with a square dance caller who was taken to his first night of lessons. So I really didn't get a chance to even decline it. You know, sort of embarrassed and say, well, I'm riding in your car and I don't want to go. (laughs) (laughs) But needless to say, uh, it was not like in college. It was completely different. College was sort of, college square dance at that time was not a lot to it. And this was pretty interesting, you know, so I sort of fell for it to begin with. That was our first dancing and that was in September. Well, by November, I was already ready to be a caller. So that whole two months, you know, I got so accomplished in square dancing, but it only took you ten lessons to learn everything there was pretty well about square dancing. In those days, it's all memorized patterns. So we belonged to a club who, in those days, believe it or not, you had to be invited to join. Uh, it wasn't a thing that you say, I'm going to come to your club. You were invited and once you visited, there was a membership committee that either recommended you or didn't recommend you to join because there was 100 couples in the club, and that was the limit that the hall would hold, and that's all they had. The name of the club was Dip and Dive, uh, which was had just come out as a brand-new call somewhere along that time. Uh, I may be wrong about that. Maybe I exaggerated that. I can, maybe that wasn't the name of it. But anyway, it was something similar to that. It was a square dance term. And so, uh, luckily, we were young enough, and Sue was pretty enough that they invited us to join. And we did, and there was 100 couples, and each time we danced, which was twice a month, you came to that club later on, and uh, about uh, the first 10 couples down the line, and then the next 10 were responsible for hosting the dance. And there were no professional callers except the one that taught us, and he lived in a different city. So what we did was rely on someone that knew one or two square dance patterns that would get up and call. And uh, when it came our time, the chairman of that particular group of 10 couples was always the first couple on the list who was the chairman. And he came to me and said, Melton, you and I are going to have to learn a square dance call. And I said, why is that? He said, because I cannot come up with enough callers for the program. And we had printed programs that we turned out every week with the names of the dances. And I was reluctant, but I thought, well, give it a whirl. He gave me a sheet of paper similar to what I'm looking at here with a square dance called on it. And I well remember the name of it, and I'm not sure how old you guys are. I know I'm as old as any of you, but it was called Double the Dose. Anybody recall that? Double the Dose. And I saw, I thought, I memorized Double the Dose from start to end. You know, it's... You had a little opening where you circle left and around the ring and break that ring with a corner swing and on to the next and around that ring and to break that ring with a corner swing. Swing that opposite across the hall because you ain't been swung since so late last fall and promenade home with a little red wagon and wheel off the back old dragon. That kind of stuff, you know. You memorize the whole thing. Then the first old couple will lead out and double the dose with the one on the right and the one on the left, meet in the middle with the once and a half and so forth. Down to the end of the hall, come back across, same old thing. To your home, everybody swing, everybody promenade. And you do it for the second couple, then the third couple, the fourth couple. So we got to memorize one time through and repeat it four times. Live music, of course. Didn't even know what a square dance record was. Melton, I'm going to interrupt you right here because Bob talked about live music. I know Jerry called to live music. We visited the other night uh, down in the lobby. What did you pay the band? Okay. Uh, I can't tell you what they paid him because I wasn't a member of the paying committee on that club. But I can tell you when, a little later what I paid mine when I first started on my own. But let me put that off just for a minute. So then, uh, so sure enough, I got up and they had the live band, which consisted of a piano, 
I always got to have a fiddle in Texas, fiddle in the band, a fiddle, a bass fiddle, and a rhythm guitar. And that was four instruments that made up our square dance band. And uh, they all drove about 30 miles to get there from a different little town. So we started out. It come my time to call, and I am sweating blood. And I walk up there, and I'd never done anything like that except when I was in the fourth grade or something. My dad wanted me to learn to play guitar, which I'd never did learn to play. But anyway, I got up there, and the guy was the band leader who was a bass fiddle player turned to me and said, uh, what hoedown do you want? And I thought, hoedown, hoedown. Oh, any of them's okay. What key do you want it in? And I thought, key. You know, and I wasn't completely naive, but I almost was. I said, uh, well, I'm not sure what key. And he said, what are you singing? I said, uh, oh, I don't know. Just play something that'll probably be all right. You know, trying to shrug it off like I knew what I was doing. And they kicked it off, and it hit me. Fortunately, it hit my range, you know. And I called Ida Red was the name of the whole damn. Ida Red, she ain't no fool, she ain't kick my bro, or something like that. Anyway, so it worked perfectly. I mean, the music for me, I thought, God, that is good. So I called it, and uh, very few goose, I got through it pretty well, and uh, got a nice applause. And you know how that makes you adrenaline flow up a man. God, I must be pretty good, all the applause I got. <laughs> Well, compared to people you don't know named Curly Mannered and Dutch somebody and somebody else, I was pretty good compared to those old geezers because I was, I was like 21, you know, and they were like 45 or 50. They were old geezers. <laughs> so I turned around to the band before I got off stage. I said, what was that key? He said, key of F. I said, I'd have read in F. He said, yeah. I said, good. Well, then I started to go and Sue and I started to go into other dances, you know, that were around different communities and within a 20, 30, 40 mile range. They all had a little square dance club and they all had a band and they had heard that I had called. So they invited me to call because they needed callers. Nobody was paid. And every time I'd get up and band say, well, you want to play? I'd say, I had a red death. <laughs> I spent a year, I spent a year trading with I had a red death. <laughs> I don't think they play in the key of F anymore, do they? <laughs> If they get off of it, they don't. I found out later on they don't like to play any. <laughs> but anyway, that was the way that went. That was funny to me. Melted so that was, uh, that was sort of that. Now then, I'll quickly get to your other point. So I decided after a little bit of that, man, this is pretty good. I'm going to make this money on my own, and I don't want to particularly work for anybody. I'd rather, always I'd rather do it on my own. So they were opening a new drive-in theater halfway between Ranger and Eastland, which was about 12 miles apart. It was sort of midway. And I had heard somewhere where they had a square dance as an opening night at a drive-in theater of another little town in West Texas. You know, somebody else's idea, but why don't I take it? So I went out during the construction phase, and I found the guy that was the owner in having it built. And I propositioned him. I said, on your opening night, why don't we have a little extra celebration and I'll bring you a square dance? And he said, that sounds like it might be a promotional thing. I said, well, you know, you can put out flyers to advertise, and I'll guarantee you we'll have people there. I said, we got like 100 couples this one club that I belong to. Okay. And he said, where do we dance? I said, we've got to have something other than dirt, you know. He said, well, I'm building the concession stand. I'll just add a little extra slab out in front enough for a few squares. Said, That's a good idea. So he did that. And then I talked to him a little further. He said, what are you going to charge me? And I said, ah. And I'm thinking, my God, what did that guy charge for teaching those lessons? And it seemed like I remember he charged 10 or $15 or 10 I think. I thought, I'm going to be brave. I said, $15 is my price. He said, 15 I said, yeah. And he haggled with it a little bit. And he said, oh, well, okay, 15 And I said, now we're going to have music. He said, okay. And I said, how many, how many uh, orchestra pieces do you think we ought to have? We call them band pieces. He said, I don't know, what do you think? I said, oh, I like to work with four. That's what I usually work with, like I knew what I was doing. <laughs> but he said, four's all right with me. I said, uh, how much do you think we should pay him? He said, that's out of your $15. <laughs> that is, I, so help me God, that's a true story. I didn't embellish that an ounce. I said, what? And we haggled a bit. He said, no, I can't do any more than that. So I went out and I hired a fiddle and a guitar, paid him seven fifty, and I took seven fifty. And we split it. Now I'm on to the quick part of the story, and I'll get off here. But the funny thing was, first night, and we had a 
bunch of people because they had advertised it with flyers around town and then a little local newspaper, big opening and featuring a square dance and he had my name, you know, like I was somebody, which I wasn't. Nobody knew who I was, but they put it on there and they thought I was somebody. So they all came out and I come out the first night. Well, the only microphone they had was one that he had. I didn't have one that that they announced over the loudspeaker things that went to the cars, you know. So he was going on me that, and I thought, well, how about the music, you know? So we got ready, and I thought, where am I going to set the music here? And he said, i got a place for you. I said, where are they? You're going to think I'm lying again. Oh, but I'm not. So help me God, I'm telling the truth. He said, I thought it would be real nice if y'all sit up there. I said, up where? On top of the concession stand. <laughs> how are we going to get up there? And he said, i got a ladder. He had no wood ladder. <laughs> So we all climb up and down here. And those musicians in those days, country musicians, just like you all, used to sit down. Nobody stood up. They sat down when they played. You know, the fiddle player and the guitar player, they had to have a chair. So they put a folded chairs for them up there, and they weren't amplified. And I've got a microphone that's going out through the speaker system, and they nobody could hear them. <laughs> Disaster. <laughs> I'm looking over the edge of the dancers. But you know, it worked for almost six weeks. <laughs> Every week for about six weeks. And it got to be at the last couple of weeks, the people in the cars that come early for the movie were so disgusted just hearing me and nothing else. They couldn't hear the music. You know, they could just sit there and hear B up there, which is a... Like somebody said that session yesterday, if, if you're in a recording session with the music, you sound pretty good. But take away the music and listen to your voice, you know, you sound like god-awful. And that's what they were hearing. So all of a sudden, one horn, they go, and another, and first thing you know, half the cars in the theater went, honk, 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 honk. In other words, get the heck out of there. And, and I did, and I did now. All right, now. I made seven dollars and fifty cents. So you made seven dollars and fifty cents. Now we're not quite done with Melton, because there was a gentleman sitting next to him, Marshall Flippo, who started square dancing about that time. What came over there? He wanted to learn to call, and Melton led him on the program. And Melton, what did you tell Marshall Flippo the first time you heard him call? I didn't want to tell him how awful he was, but I felt like it. <laughs> I'll tell you, word for word, as near as I can remember, you can either say yes or no. I said, hey, they come up. The fellow got, what's the guy's name that brought you up? Alvin Cox brought him up and said, uh, and Alvin introduced him to me to begin with. I said, I got this young guy's learned to call, and he's never called anywhere but at home. And said, uh, I wonder if you could let him call. And I said, sure. And after he said, well, what do you think? And I said, well, gosh, am I, Flip, oh, you got a really, really nice voice, but. I'm trying to be fair to you. I said, in in all honesty, I said, my God, you can't even put your foot down to the music. It's just so you're so far off the beat, it's unreal. <laughs> and he said, well, how did I do to correct that? Well, I had gone to Herb Gregson's caller school in 1950. And one of the things Herb told us was that if you really want to learn to call well, you need to learn to call while you're dancing. He said, get in a square and call to that square while you're dancing, and it'll develop your timing and keep you on the beat and so forth. I said, well, I can only pass on what I was given at caller school from her Gregson, and I said, just do that. So he went home to the chicken coop and got a square, and they were only the ones, he and his buddies were all about his size. They were only ones short enough to fit into it. I couldn't have danced in it. <laughs> Thank you, Melton Luttrell. Give him a nice hand. I want to add one quick thing. I had a I had the opportunity to call to a symphony orchestra. You're not the only one. They just didn't care about recording me. <laughs> but they they engaged me one time to do a square dance in a uh, in an opera, and I think the name is people that are knowledgeable about opera might remember. I think it's called Julia or something like that. And they had a, the only thing was they had a, a slanted stage that the dancers had to dance on so that the audience could see them, you know, and they were at a, like an angle like this. 
Oh, that was an experience because I couldn't see the orchestra. They were way down in the pit somewhere. All right. Uh, all of that leads me up to the next gentleman. Ladies and gentlemen, he's from Tucson now, but from Abilene, Texas, Marshall Flippo. Give him a big hand. Thank you, Jerry. All right. Now, because Bob and Al started in a chicken coop, and I knew Flippo did, I didn't realize it was a short chicken coop. I'm sorry about that. Not very tall. Not very tall. But Flip did, in order to learn to call, took Melton's advice and learned to dance. Tell him about the chicken coop, Flippo. Well, the chicken coop was uh, it all three squares. It's out of Wiley, Texas. It's where I went to school. And uh, an old boy named uh, Ed Hall had a farm out there, and he had a chicken coop. And he, uh, he was in the same class that Betty Casey uh, that we were in. In 1950, and Betty Casey taught us, and he said, and they had a club in Abilene now that was a 25-square club, and it was kind of like Melton said, uh, you had to be invited to join that club. So uh, he said, I got an old chicken coop out there. I'll clean that sucker out, and we'll dance out there. And they said, well, how big is it? Well, he said, I don't know, big enough for a couple of squares. So it hold about three squares. He cleaned it up real good. And we danced out there, and, and uh, there's a we didn't have any any uh, caller, so we we danced to records when there wasn't many records at the time. Let's go try some out, and uh, Joe Lewis, and uh, and uh, Jonesy, do you remember Jonesy? Jonesy had some records out on Capitol that you couldn't dance. And uh, what had happened, he played in a band, and he just picked up the lingo, you know, and he said, I, I can record this stuff. So he recorded a bunch of it. it just what he picked up, he didn't know it. It wouldn't work or whatever. <laughs> but then he got to where he, got to where he, could, uh, uh, he could call. But anyway, where are they? Uh, so there's, there's, there's a... T- Three squares out there. We didn't have any, like I say, we didn't have any music or I mean, uh, band or anything. So we all decided to learn one call. And I remember I had a big old record like this. Uh, it, I forget what the hold down was, but it wasn't uh, wasn't your hold down. It wasn't skillet looking. I don't imagine. No. But anyway, I learned dip and dive. That was the first one I learned. And um, all the rest of the guys, we learned one apiece. So we had, you know, we had 12 callers there, and we go right through a dance pretty good. So then somebody said, there's no boy over in Eastland, man, he's good. He said, we ought to go over and dance to him. He got a band going and everything. Well, now in Abilene, they had a band up uptown, you know. But I tell you, uh, the band that Melton had over there, we'd go over every second and fourth Tuesday night over to Eastland and dance to Melton. It's before I ever started calling. And, uh, boy, he had a good band. And, and Al Parks, Gerald Parks, Travis, Travis, and uh, Coon Dawson. Coon Dawson's a fiddle player. Bootlegger. Bootlegger. And... Uh, I'll guarantee you, I've never seen a square dance band that good as, as those guys were. Of course, Gerald and uh, and Al were brothers, and uh, Gerald played the piano, and, and, and Al played the rhythm guitar, and uh, they were flat uh, flat good. And uh, <laughs> so, I don't know, uh, what else? Well, when you... When you did the chicken coop thing, you you learned to call there, learned to call your calls. But as you expanded from that, you went out of the chicken coop. You also, in 1958, helped build a hall. Were these 12 couples or several of these couples involved in that? Because that no. hall is still there. No, they, uh, there were just four couples, but they weren't involved with the chicken coop at all. Okay. Flippo was calling with live music at the time, and it heard... Well, I... He decided 
to move on to Fort Worth and go back to TCU and finish his education. So I said, can I take that band over to Abilene? Will they come over there? He said, sure, go ask them. So they came over there, and so we, uh, and I never will forget, uh, you know, you call to the band, and if you cut across for something, they would they'd cut across with you, and you never know it. So I got this record on, uh, my little girl, da 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 and, uh, and I'd call it with a band, you know, and just go right through it. And I got this record from Windsor, and uh, I got to this one place, and the record was bad. <laughs> so my wife knew a little about music. I said, Lisa, come here. This record is, I, I'm going to send it back. It's not right. And she said, what's wrong with it? I said, well, it gets off tune and everything. Well, I wasn't waiting for the phrase to end, see. So she told me, so wait, you got to wait there at that one point. You got to wait there. Every time we'd go through seven times, we'd go through that damn thing. And at that, at that one particular point, I'd cut across, you know, and wait for the end of the phrase. So she finally told me, said, you got to wait there. So I never will forget Al Parks <laughs> played a rhythm guitar. Next time I called with the band, I waited. <laughs> and they'd been cutting across. <laughs> so so I get through with it. Old Al looked at me and said, you SOB? He said, that's the first time you've ever called that ride. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it was a good band and everything. And, uh, and Alvin Cox, he had... Uh, 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 he went up to Melton, unbeknownst to me. He didn't bring me up there. He come back and told me that he had told you that I had started calling. So we danced to Melton a long time before I started calling. But anyway, <laughs> so uh, we was headed home that night. It's 60 miles from Abilene over to Eastland. And, uh, and we was headed home that night. We'd go over every second for Tuesday night and dance to old Melton. And uh, I said, uh, he said, uh, I told my little boy, you'd call. I said, well, why'd you tell him that? You know, I had to get up right there. And he said, well, I, said, I thought you was calling. I didn't know any difference. So uh, he told me that Melton, this is the first time I ever heard this. Melton says, uh, I said, what did he say about my calling? Afterward, he said, he said, uh, don't give up your day job. <laughs> and I had never heard that, so I realized that. Well, uh, but anyway, that's the way it all started. You bet. Also, Jerry Held has a, a little story about you, Flippo, if you would like to hand that microphone over. No, I, I'm not going to give back to him. <laughs> no way. One of the best and most relaxed and least tired, less tired, that I ever got at a square dance or at a, at a guy calling the square dance was Bob, uh, Bob Oscar's memorial. Jerry, Kathy brought Jerry over there to the memorial and, and he had us all do a square dance sitting down. Done the whole damn thing. And, uh, and unbelievable. And I thought, boy, I'm going to remember that. I remember it about a day. But, uh, <laughs> But it was really, 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 I think, unique. This guy, is a, he's brilliant. He's an he's a engineer, you know. Yeah. Hand him the microphone because he's going to tell on him. He, well, he's yeah. really got a toupee on, too. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, anybody here remember Joe Lewis? Anybody remember a place called Kirkwood Lodge? I happened to have a gig with Joe Lewis and myself at Kirkwood Lodge. And you've had Shut up! <laughs> <laughs> so, got there and people are coming in and somebody said, there's a guy here that just cut a record. And he's um, cut this record called uh, 
what was the name of that record again? The Auctioneer. And his name is Marshall Flippo. And I thought, Marshall Flippo? Did, that's, did you say Marshall Flippo? I thought, man, that's a stage name if I've ever heard it. Marshall Flippo. Now, hand that back to him because we're going to talk. No, he's going to. Well, he had, uh, you had laryngitis, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, I had all kinds of doctors in there for him and everything. And uh, I remember he had laryngitis. But uh, so uh, I think it lasted all week, didn't it? (laughs) It lasted a long time. No. Marshall Flippo uh, was calling with the band, heard Leroy Van Dyke do the auctioneer that just came out on the radio. And in 1958, he was doing it live. Some people heard heard him do it and told a gentleman by the name of Norm Merbach. And now Flippo will relate the story how the auctioneer came to be. Well, no boy came by there, old Andy Lyons, and he had a, he had a buddy with him. him and they had their wives, too. But... Uh, uh, Andy Lyons, and this other one was a French guy like Bordeaux or something like that. But I can't think of his name, but they was down from Beaumont, and they were traveling through Abilene. They came to a dance that we had with the band uh, up in the Hayloft, and uh, which would dance um, 12 squares, and it's up above a garage, and uh, the floor... Uh, Oh, I remember. I remember Gerald Parks one time said, "We we got to watch it. Look at that floor." And you know, it was. Uh, and so we'd go down there. And we'd look underneath there. You know, we'd go down the garage. We'd look underneath there. We didn't know a damn thing. And uh, I think it's okay. It's not going to fall down. But anyway, uh, where was I? They heard you. They heard you do the auctioneer. Oh yeah, the they music. yeah they came by one night and danced with us up there, and I called the auctioneer with a band, and uh, he said, uh, "You want to record that? Why don't you record it?" I said, "I don't know how to record anything." He said, "Well, uh, we know an old boy there in uh, Houston that's uh, got a recording company. Do you mind if we tell him?" I said, "No, go ahead." So I had this letter from uh, Murbach, Norman Murbach. I worked for him 28 years, but uh, he said, you know, callers tend to pick up calls that are easy to learn, you know, and so that's just too many words that I don't think we'd do that. So I said, all right, I understood that because I was one of the callers that picked up the easy stuff. And uh, so about a month later, he called me, said, you want to do that thing? So I said, uh, well, sure, I, I'll do it. And he said, well, come on down here. So after after that building we had uh, that we had built uh, uh, one Saturday night, we got through the dance and Nisa and <laughs> uh, Nisa and her mother and father, we took off to Houston. The seven after, hours. This is after midnight. Yeah, seven hours, and Fred, that is Nisa's, uh, Nisa's husband, Nisa's dad, and uh, and Floyd, and uh, Fred drove a while, and I drove a while, Nisa drove a while, and uh, so we got down there about nine in the morning, and uh, well, it's about nine, I guess, when we went to Murbach's house. And we had already had breakfast. And he said, we're going over here to Washington Street and, and cut that sucker. So we went over there, and, uh, and I remember it was raining. I, in Houston, it's got to be raining. So it was raining. I remember that. And uh, so we cut it. It was lucky we got through it in, in the first time through. And at that time, it's a lot different now, way different. But at that time, the band played it, and you were in there with the band when they were playing it, and you called it. If one of the band members screwed up, over again, you know, we start from scratch. And uh, if you fouled up, <laughs> same thing, you know. <laughs> but we got through it the first time, and uh, we we hopped back in the car. We was leaving there about about eleven thirty, twelve. We taking back to Abilene, but. Uh, uh, that's 
started it all. What an interesting story. Marshall Flippo. Okay, we have a few minutes, and I'd like to know if there are people who have questions for our panel. And again, I want to go through them. This is Bob Brundage, Jerry Helt, Melton Luttrell, and Marshall Flippo. So if you have questions, please put it on the microphone and direct it to them. Annie, uh, Georgine from Olympia, Washington. Uh, can you, any one of you, give what the meaning of the term tip came from? And the term pay the band. Yeah, I, I, I know the story. You know, I can't authenticate it. <clears throat> but the story is that in the old days, there was a music usually consisted of just what we had, a fiddle and a guitar and occasionally a bass or a piano or something like that. It was the three basic instruments that we had in West Texas. And in the old days when they would have the so-called barn dances and everything, uh, there was no paid anybody. Everybody was just working. But the term was, uh, well, okay, after you finish dancing, you come and uh, you'll pay the fiddler and tip the caller. Uh, uh, excuse me. Got it backwards. You you pay the – I got it wrong. No, you don't pay anybody. You kiss the caller and you tip the fiddler and, and, and kiss the caller. That's what it was. And they used to say that all the time. Come tip the tip the fiddler and kiss the caller. Do you know about? I'm sorry. Do you know? Do you know why, how the term tip came? Do you know how the term tip came to be? All right, Johnny. Um, I'm Ann Wass from Riverdale, Maryland. I just like any of you or all four, if you've had the experience, could you tell us about your first time ever um, calling overseas to a group of non-Americans? Well, we, as square dancers, we have a language of our own. And the Europeans and Japanese and all those people have learned our square dance language. And you can call a dance, and they'll dance, but you go over and say hi to them, nothing. So I think it, and I think and I think the guys will agree that we have a language, and they've learned that language. Does that answer your question? No, I just wanted to know more about how the term came about. Because I found that that term came from the Americans, and they used it here. Well... Yes, it's it's kind of an American thing, but it really isn't. A lot of our dances go back to English, Scottish, Irish. So we're, it's not really an American. The current square dance thing is pretty much American. But uh, going back to the language thing, I think that's one of those. It's a, it's a language that we all have, a language that the square dancers have. I have a real good answer to that uh, my only experience overseas has been uh, England, Australia, and New Zealand, and none of them speak English. <laughs> At least they don't speak Texan. I'll put it that way. I was told the first time I went over to call it, and I spent a year uh, in Japan uh, right after, well, we were going in to invade Japan, and we spent took our troops in as uh, occupational forces right after the war, and I spent a year there at that time. But I didn't learn any of their lingo or anything. But when I went back, I thought, uh, after I learned to call and everything and, and went back over there, uh, some somebody told me, uh, now you can't call anything. You just can't call Alaman and live and walk by your partner. They don't know what walk means. you got to say a, a square dance term, you know, like pass. I happened to run into Flippo, went to a dance of his right after he'd come back from Japan the very first time. And when he walked up, he's bound to me. He was bound to everybody the whole time. <laughs> Question in the back. 
Barbie Ashwell from Oregon. Two questions. Can anybody tell me where the term yellow rock got started or how? And was it typical back in your day that there was no alcoholic beverages at the dances as is typical today? That flip. It's. I did a little, re- a little research on Yellow Rock and found out that it was a term used in the gold rush days in the saloon. If somebody had a big hit, got a lot of gold, he would put his gold up here and say Yellow Rock, and everybody would hug everybody because he's going to buy the drinks. Alcohol. I only know that uh, it wasn't permitted. It was written in most of the early club rules. It was written that uh, there was no alcohol to be consumed on during the dance or before, only after. Now, those old barn dances were different. Yeah. <laughs> okay, other questions. I have a question and um, that I'd like to direct at any of you. How long were the dances, Bob? Were they two-hour dances, three-hour dances? No, we uh, our dances were from nine to one, and uh, occasionally people weren't ready to go home yet, so we'd pass the hat. And we, however much money we collected, we might play for another half hour or another hour. So uh, four hours was our standard dance. Eight to eleven thirty forever when we started. That's about right. Uh, three hours, three and a half, and uh, I and a lot of times no round. I remember the first time I ever singing call. Do you, do you, when you started, they had singing calls, didn't they? Did you have singing calls at early things? No. The first one I ever heard was a thing called Darktown Strutter's Ball, and my golly, I thought how how great that was to be able to sing something rather than, you know, it was a very simple figure, it's Darktown Strutter's Ball. In the back, John. Well, um... What about square dance attire in the in the earliest days? I mean, I imagine it was rather different from what we now think of as square dance attire. Well, I guess you'd call street clothing, whatever. I don't think people really, maybe in Texas they dressed up a little bit, but most of ours, you wore casual clothes with, that you would wear to a... a some kind of a party or any, you know, probably long, what, what do you, as Kathy is saying, long pants. Really? Long dresses. Okay, long dresses. But I think that come along uh, probably later on. 40s, yeah. But most of it prior to the 40s was casual clothes in our area. Uh, in our area, I still remember Sue. Our first uh, attire was the guys always wear Western something, whatever you could get. And, you know, that was Western. That was very easy to get in Texas because most everybody dressed Western anyway. The uh, But she wore the really long square dance dresses with the hoops that you had to fold up, you know, and they had some kind of stifter in there. And we'd always pack the petticoat in the trunk, you know. So she got there, and you, there's, a, there's a trick to folding that thing up like a figure eight or something. I used to could do it, and then you could unfold it and pop out. I say it's the same way. Nisa had a couple of those long dresses with the hoops and everything. And, uh, and uh, every time we come over there, we're, uh, for a long time, they never did get shorter. Then they started getting short. And shorter. And shorter. Other questions in the back, sir? Yes. When did extemporaneous uh, patter calling start as opposed to uh, uh, patterns, uh, memorized patterns? Jim Bale did research 
on that. Jim Bale has been researching that, and I know he's written me and a bunch of others. Best we could determine somewhere in the early 50s. I remember specifically when it was for me because I made the mistake of moving from West Texas to Fort Worth, which was a little more sophisticated. And they, someone knew me and knew I was coming, so wanted me to be a caller for a new club they formed. And after the first tip, I was read the right act by a lady that came up and they said, you can't do that. That's not a problem. I called her right and left through in a round one, which is a patterned square dance call that was memorized, which essentially was passed through in a round one by our today's standards. But the name of the call was right and left through in a round one. I still have it in an old book, you know. And, man, she said, you cannot do that. Uh, in many cases, I think uh, you would announce the next dance will be Grapevine Twist. And you'd call that pattern. You, But you'd never deviate from that pattern if you call that whole routine of Grapevine Twist. Yes, and it, it was the visiting couples thing. It was for every couple when you did couple number one. And then it progressed around. Other questions? Bill Hyman. Bill Hyman from New Hampshire. Marshall, I wonder if you could share with us your first sight calling experience in Japan. You You kidding me? I didn't do any sight there. It's all memory. Uh, uh, What are you, uh, are you referring to a certain... I know, uh, uh, well, I'm kind of like Ken Bauer, uh, there's a, I used to, I call over, and, <laughs> now I'm going to tell this, but is this being recorded? <laughs> Not recorded? No, no, no. I was kind of like Ken Bauer, uh. When he first when he first started, he was getting out a little, you know. And I, I was always calling up there in, uh, in Detroit and up in uh, what's right above it there. Uh, no, 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 uh, town uh, where they make trucks. Flint. They'd always be down there, uh, uh, down in Detroit. There'd be a, a, a two or three couple of blacks coming, good people. Really nice, dress good, everything. And uh, the guy come up for it uh, one night and said, "Can you call for our club? We meet on Sunday afternoon." And I said, "Well, I'm only up here one time a year, and I don't have any Sunday afternoon." I said, "Well, come out to the car because I didn't want him to think that I wouldn't call for him." So I went out and showed his book and everything. And he said, "Is there anybody we can get kind of surprise?" Uh, our club, and I said, there's no boy in, the, in Des Moines that is really, really good, and uh, I think you'll enjoy him. And she said, what's his name? I said, Ken Byer. I said, you got his address? And I said, sure. Well, they hired old Ken, and they didn't tell him it was a black club. And so <laughs> Ken told me later on, he said, good Lord, said, he called me up. He said, uh, and that's when you didn't have a cell phone. He's, he's paying money for this. And, uh, he called me up and said, man, I didn't know it was a black club. He said, I pulled up to this, this dancing in a church. And said, I pulled up to this church, and they were all outside. And it was about 30 minutes before the dance. They were all outside. It was a beautiful day. And said, they all had on uh, uh, white shirts, the men did, and black pants. And the ladies all had on black skirts and white blouses. And here I am, a side caller. I said, now, I am not racist or anything like that. I've got a, well, my best buddy in the Navy in uh, World War II was a black guy. But uh, <laughs> I said, what'd you do? He said, I started mashing them up by their bridge work. And <laughs> that's kind of what I did there. <laughs> Let me pass on just a little. One of our very well-known callers, who will be nameless here, was hot on sight calling. He had just picked it up, learned it really good.
goes to Japan to call. The first first group he has over there are all women. It was not me. Uh, everybody's looking over here. Uh, and that happens a great deal, or you'll get clubs that are in club costumes. And Jack Lazar used to, I asked him one time, what do you do about people come in in club costumes? And he said, pick tall people, short people, or lady with big shoes. Uh, Jack Lazar, told me that. It's a true story. I, I don't want to monopolize, but I got to tell one really cute story. And a few of you knew Joe Lewis, Joe Lewis, and he, along with the three or four other callers, were always my dearest friends, escort edge callers. And uh, there's, he and Les Gilcher were as different as black and white. You couldn't be any more different people than Les Gilcher and Joe Lewis. Joe Lewis was musically inclined and talented, and everything was on phrase and everything. And Les Gilcher was wham, bam, get you, ma'am, and this sort of thing, you know. And he always dressed in black, and Joe always dressed in the nice costumes. And both were touring at the time. And uh, this lady came up to Joe, and he, he, the way he described it to me, he said, a very little young cutie thing come up, all excited about it and everything. And said how glad she was to meet him and how nice she enjoyed the dance. And then during the conversation, I said, you know, she said, guess what? And she said, what? I said, I got to dance with Les Gilcher just last week. He said, well, that's nice. And she said, oh, yeah, it was just wonderful. Well, I was wondering, what do you think about him? And she said, it may surprise you, ma'am, but I think of him hardly at all. <laughs> I have to bring up a name here who was kind of, I'd say, my mentor. And these guys will know who it is, Ray Smith. Ray uh, really coached me and talked to me about how to dress, how to look, and how to present yourself. And I really appreciate that information that Raymond gave me. I bless him. Well, if you want to talk about costume, you want to dance to Cal Golden. As Cal would come out to, uh, for the first tip, you have on a blue hat and a light blue shirt and a blue jacket and blue pants and blue boots. And after two or three other tips, all of a sudden you turn around and look up on the stage and he's got a green hat and a light green shirt and a and he changed, completely changed costume sometimes two or three times a night. That's a true story. And Cal told me one time, he says, don't ever start something you don't plan to do the rest of your life. He <laughs> told that. Our time is just about up. I, I have to tell you, it's a privilege to be here as part of, as a moderator for this panel. I love the visit with the legends. And I hope you've enjoyed Bob Brundage, Jerry Helt, Melton Luttrell, Marshall Flippo. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being a part of Caller Lab. If you'd like a picture of them, you ought to get your picture.